Hello everyone, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar with Clean Horizon, where we will be hearing about and discussing the prime potential of energy storage in India, which has only just begun its story. My name is Andy Colthorpe, I'm the editor of Energy Storage News, and we've been covering the industry for close to a decade now. I'm delighted to see interest in energy storage in India begin to take root and grow over the past couple of years, driven largely by the ambitious target for 500 gigawatts of wind and solar by 2030. And by the way, India's installed renewables capacity has already exceeded 150 gigawatts. And it isn't just the renewable energy target that's driving interest. There is also the mission to bring energy access to rural communities that aren't connected to the grid, as well as improving the quality of power on the grid for those that are, and to roll out electric vehicles. From union and state governments to regulatory authorities, to private companies within India and from abroad, the framework of a very promising market and more than 100 gigawatt hours of potential opportunities are coming into place this decade. At Energy Storage News, we're always excited to report on the big picture topics, the projects, and the technologies that influence the growth of energy storage, but we always do our best to find the experts with deep knowledge and involvement to really help us to understand the markets we cover. And that's why today I'm really pleased to introduce you to our speakers. Dr. Rahul Wallawalka, uh, speaking today in his capacity as founder and president of India Energy Storage Alliance, is also a director at Customized Energy Solutions, and he will present an overview of the drivers and the market activity already underway. Dr. Bharat Reddy of the Solar Energy Corporation of India, or SECI, will offer insights into the business models that are being developed, learning through deployments as well as studies of how to unlock the potential, SECI's current 1000 megawatt hour standalone storage tender and SECI's general strategies around energy storage. And Rachel Loquet from Clean Horizon has done some very comprehensive work, crunching the numbers and modeling how tenders for energy storage that are taking shape will work in India and the revenue streams that can be expected from these and associated business cases. Our webinar today will include short presentations from the speakers, after which we will have a panel discussion and then a Q&A with you, the audience. And of course, as always, interaction with you is very important to us and we will try and answer uh, as many of, our, of your questions as we can before the end of the session. So please do put your questions for the speakers into the tab marked questions on the right hand side of your screen. We will do our best to answer them. Finally, presentation slides will be sent out to all registrants and a recording of the webinar will be made available on demand on the Energy Storage News website and later on on YouTube. So without further ado, I'm very happy to hand you over to our first speaker, Dr. Rahul Walla Walker. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to participate in Energy Storage News and Solar Media webinars. Uh, really thank you for uh, our partnership over the last 10 years for bringing awareness about India's uh, evolving energy storage sector and yes I think in the last two years there's a lot of excitement a lot of activity but it has taken us uh, last 10 plus years to uh, uh, create the policies to enable this so again I really value our partnership uh, as Andy mentioned I am uh, president and managing director for customized energy solutions in India which is a global consulting and services firm headquartered in US uh, with operations now in Japan, Canada, Mexico, Vietnam and India and we also manage more than 15 gigawatt of assets including one and a half gigawatt hour of energy storage. Um, we started India Energy Storage Alliance in uh, 2012 to create awareness about advanced energy storage technologies in Indian market. And then in 2015, we create, we set up the vision to make India a global hub for R&D, manufacturing and adoption of advanced energy storage and e-mobility technologies. And especially last five years, we have worked a lot on try to generate the demand as well as uh, create policies for supporting manufacturing in India. And happy to say that in last 10 years, IEC has grown from just five members to now close to 170 members uh, uh, showing the growth of the industry. Uh, 
as I mentioned, uh, the policy framework in India has evolved over the last 10 years. So uh, the work started in 2013 with Ministry of Power and Central uh, uh, Electricity Agency setting up um, a task force for looking at large scale renewable integration. And at that scale, large scale was being looked at around 20 to 30 gigawatt renewables by 2020. Uh, in 2014, that scenario changed when Honorable Prime Minister Modi ji upgraded the vision where he set the target just for solar to 100 gigawatt by uh, 2022 and additional 60 gigawatt for wind. And that started uh, uh, a realization in Ministry of New and Renewable Energy for needing to have a sustained uh, policy work on energy storage. And MNRE created a standing committee for energy storage and a lot of work has happened over the year. I'm really excited to share the stage with Dr. Bharat Reddy, who has been a key stakeholder and key partner uh, during this journey for last 10 years. And he will share more details about specific steps being taken by Solar Energy Corporation under the MNRE uh, guidance uh, for making the market happen. But uh, what is exciting is there are many agencies, including Central Electricity Regulatory Commission, Department of Heavy Industries, uh, Niti Ayo, Ministry of Power. All of the ministries have realized the importance of energy storage for both the stationary as well as e-mobility market. And all of them are working together uh, through uh, Niti Ayo for uh, helping uh, creating enabling policy framework. Um, as uh, Andy mentioned, India has set a target for non-fossil fuel generation to be around 500 gigawatt by 2030, of which the wind solar uh, is uh, expected to cross around 400 gigawatt. Rest will be between hydro and biomass. Uh, and out of this, uh, uh, majority is expected to be grid scale uh, renewables, then followed by wind, and then remaining part being taken by rooftop uh, photovoltaic, which is actually perhaps the sector which has lagged as compared to the original target of uh, 100 gigawatt uh, by 2022. Uh, there are a number of studies which are currently being conducted. This is just a recent study which uh, we did with uh, World Resources Institute where we looked at particularly state of Tamil Nadu. Uh, similar to many of the uh, developed countries where one region ends up driving uh, development. In India, Tamil Nadu is a similar state uh, which has led the de deployment of both wind and solar uh, and it is a most uh, uh, highest installation of renewables in India and they have still further aggressive plan and we looked at various scenarios uh, in terms of meeting these renewable targets and what type of a uh, cost saving will be possible with or without storage and almost in every scenario as you can see on the right hand side uh, the uh, total system cost with storage was lesser than without storage. And these type of studies are helping creating uh, policy support for uh, uh, for uh, uh, energy storage, both at state as well as at central level. If you want to read more about it, you can download this report from uh, IESA or WRI websites. So it is available as a free resource. Uh, also, another opportunity has been on the island side, and this was actually a low hanging fruit where somehow we have not really tapped into the potential. Uh, this is just a screenshot of a study which we had done back in 2014 showing that uh, uh, if we are adding solar on some of these islands which are completely uh, powered by diesel, we need to uh, add uh, storage uh, to try to make sure that we can actually shut down the DG sets rather than just continuously ramping them to address the variability. Uh, there was a first project got installed in 2019 for around uh, 8 megawatt hour of uh, storage for 20 uh, uh, megawatt of solar, uh, but unfortunately, because of the variability, it has not been able to perform to the uh, designed expectations. So, uh, uh, Solar Energy Corporation asked us to do a detailed study to understand, evaluate the problems, and recommend additional uh, storage requirement. And based on that, there is a uh, expected that us RFP will soon get floated for additional 20 megawatt hour of storage addition for the same project. The other area where uh, there is a lot of debate in India is about with all these renewables coming in, should India just look at using existing thermal assets for balancing this? And there are many international agencies as well as a very strong lobby from the existing thermal asset owners, uh, which is promoting that India should just be using uh, flexibilization of existing coal plants and look at uh, coal plus RE for getting uh, uh, round-the-clock power. 
but we feel that that is actually a counterbalancing to the actual objective of why we are adding all the renewables and there is a better way of integrating these renewables with storage which can be actually much cheaper than running some of the inefficient coal plants and operating those on a partial level not just economically but especially from the environmental point of view where both SOX and NOx emissions could be much higher and we will lose out the benefits of adding renewables if we keep on relying on these fossil generators as a backup. That doesn't mean all fossil generators need to be shut down. We feel that especially for next 10 years, 15 years, there is a role for both the thermal sector as well as uh, renewables coupled with energy storage to enable a clean energy transition for India. Uh, other debate has been around ancillary services and again since 2014 we have worked on creating the policy framework central electricity regulatory commission has finally after almost six plus years of effort uh, has earlier this year allowed uh, energy storage to participate in ancillary framework uh, the only challenge is it is still not uh, done in an optimal way uh, as in the fast uh, frequency response or other valuable services are not very well defined and they are not able to be monetized but uh, I, India Energy Storage Alliance is part of a Central Electricity Regulatory Commission Central Advisory Committee and we will continue the fight to make sure that uh, energy storage technologies can tap into this valuable stream. Uh, earlier uh, last month, IESA released uh, uh, India 2030 vision document, uh, which was released by Honorable Joint Secretary for MNRE and uh, Ministry of Power. Uh, Mr. Dinesh Jagdai and Mr. Ganesham Prasad respectively and under this uh, uh, vision document we have set a target for 160 gigawatt hour by 2030 not including the uh, behind the meter inverter and UPS market. Uh, if you consider the behind the meter market in terms of the inverter and UPS which is already a, a quite dominant market we do expect that between 2022 to 2030 the overall market in India will be more than 400 gigawatt hour. Uh, you can get these reports from India Energy Storage Alliance websites. Uh, India has also started deploying projects. It all started with a small 500, mega, uh, 500 kilowatt project deployed by Power Grid Corporation in Pondicherry, followed by the NTPC project uh, or the Andaman Nicobar project. And then uh, Tata Power has hosted a project which is installed by AES and Mitsubishi uh, in Delhi for 10 megawatt. And learning for these projects is very useful. Now the key question is, will India just become a big market as it has happened with cell phones, with laptops, with solar energy, uh, but then dependent on 90 plus percent of the value addition being happening from just imported components. So in 2016, we set a vision that no, India cannot repeat this. We need to start working on uh, manufacturing policy. And simultaneously, we have started uh, creating capacity building in industry by hosting various master classes. The next one is being hosted uh, on 7th to 9th uh, July in Chennai. Uh, we are very happy that uh, our efforts have been noticed directly at the highest level by Prime Minister himself and uh, the recommendations provided by IESA have been incorporated into the uh, advanced chemistry cell production link incentive program created by Niti Aayog where India had set already uh, uh, had selected winners for 50 gigawatt hour manufacturing and there is an additional RFP coming out for 5 gigawatt hour of niche SEC uh, RFP. Uh, so what IESA has done it is IESA has now set a vision for uh, going for not just looking at this 50 gigawatt hour manufacturing under PLI but looking at crossing at least 100 gigawatt hour by 2030 and 500 gigawatt hour by 2035 as well as not just looking at cell manufacturing but looking at the complete value chain and through India Battery Supply Chain Council we are working on enabling complete supply chain development in India for making India a global hub. So to conclude, uh, in last 10 years, the policy framework for energy storage and EVs have evolved steadily in India. Uh, uh, the, with the cost reductions which have happened around the globe, uh, uh, we think that uh, uh, this sector is poised for uh, exponential growth in the uh, coming decade. There is no doubt that India will be amongst the top three markets. Uh, the key part is we feel that we need to work together to also make India a key manufacturing hub. Uh, and uh, the most important learning what we feel is that we cannot keep on just waiting for manufacturing scale up for increasing deployment. There are a lot of learnings which come from implementing the project, designing the project, optimizing the project. 
which you cannot just achieve by having cheaper batteries or cheaper energy storage solutions. And that's where the type of projects what uh, Dr. Bharat Reddy is uh, uh, proposing for Seiki and others are going to be very crucial in next 12 to 18 months because these will become the foundation for the uh, hundreds of gigawatt hour of storage which is going to get deployed in uh, coming decade. Uh, I would lastly just like to request you to block your date for 22nd September, which is World Energy Storage Day, uh, where we will be discussing not just India, but global opportunities and exploring partnerships around the world. So with this, I'd like to thank and hand it over back to Andy. Thank you so much, Dr. Walla Walker. Uh, so great presentation there. And uh, just a very quick note to a couple of people that have said they're having a bit of sound problems. I'd recommend if you please just try refreshing and coming back in again. Uh, we're sorry about that, but it does appear to be working on our end. And so, yeah, with that, um, I'd like to present over to our second speaker, uh, Dr. Reddy. Uh, Dr. Reddy, um, if you'd like to come online now. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Andy, uh, for giving this opportunity and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dr. Dr. Rahul has given a it's great overview about the energy storage market in the country. And right now we are, uh, I'm just speaking about the, what we are thinking in terms of renewables. Okay, how to uh, penetrate the energy storage. Uh, what is the role of energy storage in the renewables? Uh, if you just see uh, the, the energy storage requirements are uh, two types in the, uh, renewables. One is to cater the large scale deployments in the of the renewable projects in the grid. So there we need a grid scale uh, energy storage is very much required. Another one is uh, also we do have a targets for uh, achieving distributed generation. To increase the distributed generation again energy storage plays a crucial role. It is quite important. I'll be explaining these things in the coming slides. Okay. So if you see the uh, the recent target is now 450 gigawatt RE by uh, 2030, even 500 gigawatt uh, from clean energy sources. With all these targets, uh, uh, there are some reports being published by LBNL, CEA, and uh, many other agencies. Uh, if you closely observe these uh, reports, okay, there is uh, the 2030 scenario is given clearly that uh, once we achieve the targets, uh, there will be uh, the curtailment of uh, uh, RE power, that is one thing. Because of the generation and demand mismatch, uh, it is on the positive side. Generation is more and demand is less, especially during solar hours that need to be managed. And another one is uh, uh, demand creation for RE itself is a uh, thing actually. To achieve these targets, obviously we need uh, a demand creation. So for that, we need to think of uh, replacement of uh, suboptimal uh, thermal uh, power generation through RE power, that is one thing. And also even to replace uh, some of the old thermal plants uh, to address the base load also, uh, that, is that is need to be addressed uh, to address the future demands. And uh, especially in the solar uh, uh, capacities, uh, uh, the, the poor utilization of transmission and distribution infrastructure is again a problem. So that need to be, uh, addressed uh, in all these things in all these three areas uh, storage plays a key role actually in reducing curtailment in uh, uh, means uh, means uh, creating uh, uh, means uh, dispatchable power to replace thermal plant for that also you need storage even to optimize the uh, transmission and uh, distribution also we need storage actually Uh, the drivers of storage is, uh, in the, as I mentioned in the early slide, it is to address the base load. We need to address the base load in future uh, with uh, renewables. Uh, we already started RTC renewables uh, projects. Okay, that is one thing. And also the peak load, uh, uh, we uh, we are recently at witnessing if there is a variation of a great increase in the peak load, and uh, so that need to be addressed uh, with simple RE, it is not possible. With RE plus storage only will address. Uh, spinning reserves, currently it is dependent on conventional sources. In future, we need to address the spinning reserve issue also through renewables. In this case also, storage plays a vital role. And transmission optimization, again, the storage required. Uh, distributed distribution level also, it is required. 
if you see the duration of the load curve and all, okay, the, the, the close observation to this curve, uh, what indicates is that duration of the peak is increasing. Okay, uh, it is around four hours uh, on average, uh, uh, and it is growing faster than base load. So we need to address this. Okay, this requires our place storage projects more. Okay. Uh, and also the, the other analysis is that when we see the curtailment analysis, how XSRE is coming actually, uh, the 260 gigawatt solar capacities are estimated by 2030. Okay, so uh, even we optim uh, means operate the thermal plants at 40% technical minimum, it is estimated that around 10% of uh, RE will be curtailed. So it means 26 gigawatt of RE power will be uh, curtailed. So that straight away indicates that 26 gigawatt of requirement of storage is there. So that need to be managed through developing standalone storage capacities in the network. For that, we recently announced some pilots also. Soon, once after successful of these pilots, I think the more capacities will come. Okay. And to address the means overall uh, uh, renewable uh, penetration uh, is very simple okay so if once uh, if we see closely the load curve of uh, the country we do have a uh, measure base load and some peak loads in the morning and evening and also interim base load is there for that we are uh, uh, means making some products based on pure re okay uh, one is around the clock renewables uh, one is a ferment flexible re to address the interim base load and also re projects with assured peak power uh, they, they, all these projects are recently announced and some of the projects are under execution now okay so initial projects we have given multiple locations for uh, uh, because the storage is expensive we allowed uh, through excess installation excess uh, generation uh, installation now that that can be optimized by developing the projects at single location with the help of storage in future and the other one is as i mentioned is re farming and transmission optimization uh, especially for the solar project uh, the transmission utilization is very poor uh, if you see for each 10 megawatt of generation for each 10 percent of generation uh, the utilization of the transmission varies from 43% to 4%. So overall utilization is only around 25 to 30% based on the CEO of the plant. So uh, right now it is uh, uh, it is free and it is being socialized. The cost is being borne by uh, uh, discounts only out, uh, uh, finally. So this need to be optimized when, when we go for the uh, future capacities. For that, uh, what we are planning is that uh, de de uh, deployment of energy storage at the transmission network itself, so that the transmission utilization can be increased to 60-70%, and the transmission cost also can be reduced by 50% or 60%. So that we are working, and some uh, case study also we did recently, and we are in the process of optimization, uh, means implementation that where we uh, we means uh, seki or any other implementing agency will coordinate between the uh, re developer let's say solar power developer and storage developer uh, two different contracts will be there and uh, the uh, the mixed energy the firm power will be supplied to the procurer the advantages to the procurer he will get very firm power uh, compared to the simple re simple solar uh, power and the transmission utility, uh, they can save a number of uh, uh, I mean, charges, transmission charges and setting up transmission line itself is also a tedious process so that they can uh, save on the things. Uh, this type of uh, study we, we have recently done and we are planning to implement by uh, working with regulators. We, we need some regulatory changes here. So we are working on this. Uh, and this uh, similar uh, type of uh, uh, the, uh, the project implementation is being, it is already started uh, uh, at uh, Ladakh region, where the 10 gigawatt of uh, uh, capacity being planned in Ladakh. Okay? Uh, for that, uh, only uh, 5 gigawatt of transmission is envisaged. Around 12 gigawatt hour of storage is uh, being planned there. 
okay soon i think you you all will be knowing announcements in that front also and the other uh, avenue for storage is that c and i uh, means commercial and industrial consumers are uh, getting more aware of the renewables now so for better utilization of renewables they also require storage so many people they are using storage uh, for various use cases uh, like demand uh, contract demand reduction uh, their contract demand is very for very few uh, hours okay for, for that they are paying lot so that charges can be reduced and that is useful for uh, uh, utilities also so that they can manage demand easily and distributed pv consumption most of the rooftop solars they are through. right now they are banking on the banking facility so that 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 may not be possible forever so it requires storage also and many companies they are having backup power as a diesel uh, generators that is being replaced and in fact in some state governments they recently announced that all the housing societies also they need to go for uh, uh, uh means battery storage backup instead of diesel backup and price arbitrage by i think within three four years so price arbitrage also will become a crucial thing in the market okay so that is uh, becoming uh, uh, one of the uh, attractive thing for storage in the commercial and industrial consumer space and the ancillary services uh, is again a thing it, it it's again required around it's a good amount of uh, storage requirement will be there it it will not be a uh, immediate market it will slowly develop okay so that will be there the uh, government of india recently notified the guidelines for this uh, ancillary services also and uh, the, the, at the end i'd like to means give some insights on the recent uh, uh, tender of, uh, by 1000 megawatt hour tender by uh, seki uh, okay so it is a uh, first tender uh, out of 4000 megawatt hour standalone bs uh, bss pilot pro uh, projects are being planned by government of india uh, this uh, intended applications out of this is that mainly to energy arbitrage and uh, many uh, uh, discoms are having uh, getting uh, means higher uh, means uh, re generation during uh, uh, noon actually uh, they uh, they are selling in the market right now there, there might be curtailment also in future for that we are looking for energy arbitrage uh, the utilities can buy the storage and they can store this energy and they can utilize during the uh, peak peak hours okay that is one thing and ancillary services so we are reserving some capacity to the to the grid operator so he can utilize he can test this facility for ancillary services uh, to meet the ancillary services and we want to means create open market also even in the re sector and also in the energy storage uh, re sector it is it, we we traveled a lot because it is becoming difficult so in the energy storage we want to create the open market from right from the beginning okay so for that we reserved some capacity where uh, the developer can I means utilize this capacity in the market so these are the intended applications the salient features of the RFS is uh, that uh, the two projects are there of uh, uh, defined uh, 500 megawatt hour. This is 250 megawatt for two hours uh, projects. Uh, this is on the BOOT basis. Uh, the developer has to build own operate it uh, for 12 years, and at the end of the 12th year, he has to transfer it back to Seki. And land and connectivity for this project is being uh, provided by Seki. Okay both projects to be set up at the same location uh, bidder can quote for one or both projects that is allowed bidding to be conducted on single tariff that is uh, uh, capacity charge that is uh, rupees per megawatt uh, per month actually uh, on monthly basis uh, seki will sign a better energy storage purchase agreement uh, it's a capacity uh, purchase agreement for utilization of 60 percent of the capacity 40 percent need to be managed by the developer and standalone uh, means the performance criteria is there okay performance criteria we have mentioned clearly on the tender okay it is 95 percent availability should be there on annual basis annual degradation is also factored in the availability of this one and 85 percent round trip efficiency to be maintained uh, Charging discharging will be scheduled by off-taker 
developer need not to worry on uh, that okay for that 60 percent part and bs to be made available for uh, daily utilization two cycles per day is the intended utilization uh, the customer can de uh, demand for two cycles per day there are penalties on account of non-availability and also for lower uh, efficiency will be there okay some penalties are there so these are the salient uh, features so we i request uh, the audience any of the interested uh, uh, companies in the audience uh, just go through the tender i think it uh, last date is by day after tomorrow i think it may be extended uh, there are some requests we received okay it may be extended if it is getting extended please go through it and uh, plan for bidding okay thank you fantastic thank you so much dr reddy and it's uh, yeah great to hear some insights um on kind of what you've seen and learned so far uh, but also, yeah, I know a lot of people are looking at and talking about that tender and, you know, seeing what sort of wider impact that will have on the market as well as what's involved in that. OK, so that's terrific. We've got lots of questions in from the audience, but uh, you still have a little bit of more time to get some get your questions in. Um, but we'll hand over to our third and final presentation speaker, Rachel Loquet from Clean Horizon. Thanks, Rachel. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Andy. And thank you very much, Dr. Reddy and Dr. Rao for your presentations. So just a quick word on Clean Horizon. So we are an energy storage consultancy company that provides both uh, market analysis and technical consulting services. So our market analysis activities, for instance, allow us to dive deep into a country energy storage market to identify the potential revenue streams available for energy storage and as part of our technical consulting activities uh, our crystal optimization tool enables us to quantify those revenues so now building on the presentations of dr Rowe and dr reddy i will provide an overview of the current and future revenue streams for energy storage in india so the first current revenue streams uh, available for energy storage in india is the tenders as dr reddy just talked about so there are several um, energy storage tenders that have been published lately and one of them is the famous one from Seki, which is the standalone energy storage tender which is now a pilot but then they plan on launching other tenders uh, which are similar to this one in the future and as dr reddy said it's a very specific tender as part of the capacity is to be managed by Seki, and part of the capacity is to be managed by the developer so the developer needs to uh, find revenue streams to reach with that 40% capacity that it has access to. And there have been a lot of uh, other tenders, such as the ones from NTPC. Um, for example, they have launched a tender of 500 megawatts, 3000 megawatt hour. And here the goal is to use the energy storage, ten, uh, energy storage system coupled with the renewables to be able to provide power uh, during the peak hours. So it's a different application, but uh, it's another type of tender that we, we have seen. And uh, energy storage is also uh, tendered with uh, renewables. So for example, there was the tender from uh, that is called the round the clock tender. And here energy storage was coupled with renewables and the goal was to provide firm power during peak hours. So, it, so the results of the tender showed that uh, this system can be competitive with a coal power plant. Uh, so it's very interesting because here the storage enables to provide firm power with renewables. So it's very interesting, for example, for discounts, which can we ha which have obligations to buy uh, renewable energy, and it's renewable energy that is firm. So uh, it enables discounts to reduce their imba imbalances that may be caused uh, by the fact that they buy uh, renewable energy. So we we might see in the future similar tenders uh, as this one. Um, so the next uh, renewable streams that is available in India is uh, the possibility to trade electricity on the markets. So right now there are three main uh, energy markets, electricity markets in India. There's the day ahead market, the real time market and a day ahead market that is uh, specific for renewable power. And on those markets, what energy storage can do is uh, buy electricity when the prices are low and then sell electricity when the prices are high. In that way, it makes money uh, just by um, having a difference between the price at which it sold electricity and the price uh, at which it bought electricity. 
And we can see that the most interesting markets uh, for now, uh, based on the 2021 and 2022 prices, are the day ahead market and the real time markets. So those are the markets where there's the highest spread on average. So the spread is the difference between the high price of the day and the lowest price of the day. So those are typically markets where energy storage can achieve some revenues. And going back to the SEC tender, so as I mentioned, part of the capacity is to be managed by SECI and part of the capacity is to be managed by the developer. So the developer, when it is bidding in this tender, needs to assess how much revenues it can get with uh, this 40% capacity. And we used our crystal optimization tool to calculate how much revenues it can get with this uh, capacity that it has. And we estimated that around 50,000 euros per megawatt per year can be achieved on the day ahead and real time market based on the 2022 and 2021 prices. So that means that to break even uh, and to reach an IR of 8% in 12 years, the developer should bid around 60,000 euros per megawatt per year on the tender. Um, so the combination of this revenue and the revenue on the market enables it to break even uh, and to reach an IR of 8%. So the third uh, mechanism where energy storage can make revenue is called the deviation settlement mechanism. So here the goal is to help uh, utilities, so this comes, reduce their imbalance uh, because they have to pay for uh, the imbalance that they create and it can be a very high price. So storage can help them uh, reduce their imbalances. So this is quite uh, complicated, but basically uh, India has opened a mechanism that's very similar to the imbalance settlement mechanism that is used in various countries in Europe, where any uh, discom that creates an imbalance has to pay a charge uh, for that imbalance. But here in India, uh, this charge is very high because it's calculated as, as the maximum price of the day ahead market, the real time market and the ancillary services charge. So it's a maximum of those three prices. So it's already quite high. And on top of that, uh, these scams have to pay a penalty if they deviate from a large amount. So for example, if they deviate from 15%, then on top of the charge, you have to pay an additional 50% of that charge. So in total, they pay 150% uh, of the normal uh, rate of charge, which is um, overall a very high price. And it can be very penalizing for this scam. So what energy storage can do here is help the discom reduce uh, their imbalances. And that way they pay less charges and uh, they are less penalized. So this is one of the business cases that uh, can be used uh, for energy storage. So those are where the three current existing uh, revenue streams for energy storage. And as you can see, I didn't talk about ancillary services, whereas, um, for example, in Europe, most energy storage systems provide ancillary services. It's the main revenue streams. But in India, for now, the market is not yet opened. And as Dr. Reddy and Dr. Rao said, uh, the market could be uh, opening in the next few months or years. Because so currently, uh, the ancillary services are all provided by thermal power plants. So the primary reserve is a mandatory service and it has to be provided by large generators. A uh, secondary reserve is not yet opened um, in India, but it is in the process of being implemented. And as for tertiary reserve, it's also a service that is mandatory. So uh, there's no market for it uh, either right now. So right now, energy storage cannot uh, make any revenue on the ancillary services. But that is about to change as uh, in May 2021, the government has released new regulations for ancillary services. So they have uh, published a draft that introduces uh, the secondary reserve and series services and the tertiary reserve and series services. And for now, they don't plan on opening a market from primary, for primary reserve. So in the draft, what is mentioned is that uh, the secondary reserve will be uh, remunerate, remunerated uh, for the energy that is uh, dispatched. 
So the assets with a high ramping rate and a low uh, compensation charge, so typically uh, batteries, will have a higher probability of getting dispatched. And once they are dispatched, they get paid uh, the compensation charge plus a premium that depends on their performance. And this premium can be up to 47 euros per megawatt hour. So uh, a battery which has a great performances because it's a very fast asset could, could earn uh, typically that premium. And then there's the tertiary reserve. So here it's, it, it works pretty similarly to uh, European countries where so the assets have to bid a price for the up reserve and the down reserve. So for, for charging and discharging. And then uh, assets are selected in a merit order. So the more competitive are selected. And then uh, for up auction uh, all assets get paid the last asset selected so the marginal price and for the down auction uh, it's a pay as been mechanism so each asset gets gets um, has to pay for uh, the price that it has bidded so this could become very interesting for energy storage depending on uh, the prices that will um, be on these auctions so it, it's uh, very important to keep an eye on the um, evolution of the ancillary services market in India. So thank you very much for your attention and any questions are welcome. And I will let Andy uh, start with the discussion. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, and yeah, we'll be giving out um, Clean Horizon and Rachel's email addresses um, again at the end of the session. So you can uh, get in touch and continue offline. Uh, and we're aware, of course, that this is probably the most information you've been subjected to in half an hour is a lot to go through. Uh, obviously, you know, India's a big country with a big power sector and there's a huge amount of stuff uh, that's being prepared and is already happening. So we would recommend that you uh, take the time to go through the slides when you receive them, um, as you should be getting them via email. And also you'll be welcome to watch the session again um, and catch up. Uh, but in the meantime, yeah, I thought we'd kick off with a little bit of a uh, discussion with our panellists before we go into the questions from the audience. And there were plenty of questions from the audience, too. Um, but yeah, so first question I'd like to go on. And I guess, Rachel, uh, as you finish last, I think it's uh, fitting to carry on from where you sort of stopped. So one major US company I spoke with fairly recently has entered the market and said there's some unique aspects to tendering in India. So two parts to this question really. So what sort of things should people bidding in tenders in India consider that maybe aren't so common in tenders for other countries? Um, and also if we're looking at say, for example, the computation of revenues for the SECI tendered projects, um, they're expected to have a low cost per kilowatt as SECI essentially gives the site away. Um, but you said there's a you know threshold of something like 59,000 euros per megawatt per year to achieve uh, minimal profitability. So, yeah, do you want to just talk us through where that numbers come from and uh, how developers can make themselves confident they can get that return on investment uh, that they're planning for? Yeah, sure. Thank you for your questions. So, yeah, the tender from, from Siki is quite particular, as uh, as I said, and Dr. Reddy also mentioned, part of the capacity is to be managed by the developer. So in this tender, the developer needs to assess in the next 12 years how much revenues is going to be able to make on the markets with its uh, capacity. So this is the main specificity of this tender is that the developer needs to make an estimation of those revenues uh, for now and in the future. This exercise can be quite difficult to make, um, but and that is what uh, we did today. So we estimated how much revenues can be made on the markets that are currently available in India uh, using a optimization tool that we call uh, the crystal optimization tool and this tool enables to calculate uh, to simulate the operation of the battery on the markets to be able to calculate how much revenues it can make on the markets so we did that on historical prices from 2021 and 2022 and it turned out that uh, around 52,000 euros per megawatt per year for a two-hour system can be achieved uh, on the day ahead and real-time market 
but of course, for a more complete exercise, uh, the developers should uh, make a forecast of the future day ahead and real time market prices to be able to make, make a more accurate estimation of those revenues uh, in the future. And in terms of uh, calculating these 59,000 euros per megawatt per year, here we compile both the cost of the system, which are the cost of the battery system and also the cost of the um, inverters, uh, installation, etc. So those are the cost of the system, as well as the operation cost, of course, that we took into account of the battery storage system. And on the other hand, we have the revenues, which are one, the revenues on the markets, which I just talked about, plus the revenues that come from uh, the SECI uh, participation. And this is the missing part that must be uh, calculated. And uh, we calculated that missing part so that the project could reach an IR of 8% in 12 years. Wow, okay. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, Rachel, you've been working pretty hard crunching a lot of different numbers <laughs> and very yeah. to get that for our audience. Fantastic, fantastic. So, um, Rahul, uh, we're looking at the, you know, I've been reporting, as, as you mentioned, uh, a fair bit on India over the last few years, but the Central Electricity Authority has modelled a need for uh, nearly 30 gigawatts and uh, well over 100 gigawatt hours of energy storage to accommodate growth in renewable energy over the next 10 years or so. Um, just wondering if India needs a formal target program to achieve this and how you kind of arrived at sort of the levels of, of energy storage that, that you believe India will need over the next few years uh, and going further, even further into the future, I suppose, as a target sort of net zero. Sure. So thanks, Andy. I think this is a very uh, important point, and we definitely believe that yes, uh, having a very clear target helps, and that has been shown by the success of the solar deployments in India, where the National Solar Mission set a very clear target, and now those are getting expanded. Same thing is happening with the e-mobility side as well, where there is a target for 30% by 2030 for the uh, EV penetration, and that is driving a lot of development. Uh, so we have been working with Ministry of Power as part of a central technical committee in looking at uh, role of energy storage in the grid. And uh, Ministry of Power is right now basically gathering the inputs. So as part of that, over the last six months, IESA did for extensive stakeholder consultations with uh, each uh, stakeholder segmentation, right from policymakers, regulators, to utilities, to uh, IPPs and uh, technology providers. And based on that, uh, we released the vision document from IESA, where we have actually set a target for grid scale storage deployment, not considering the UPS and inverter market as 160 gigawatt hour for uh, supporting this uh, 500 gigawatt renewable target. And most of the experts, at least during the stakeholder consultation, seems to have agreed to that. So right now, Ministry of Power is considering that. And we hope that uh, in next uh, maybe two or three months, uh, uh, at least by the World Energy Storage Day on 22nd September, the storage targets will be announced by uh, Ministry of Power. Okay, okay, fantastic, fantastic. I mean, there's a, a whole lot of questions I can ask you on that, but I think we need to move on. Um, but yeah, maybe we'll come back to that from the audience questions, or perhaps we can continue that another time. Um, Dr. Reddy, um, you were mentioning the use of energy storage on the transmission network, and I was really excited to see, you know, how forward thinking and I guess progressive um, that approach is. So energy storage can be a, a useful virtual transmission asset, reducing the need for investment in transmission, but this hasn't been a widespread application around, around the world. Uh, can you explain a little bit um, where, how quickly you guys have recognized that potential for storage um, and sort of whether it will require changes in, in regulation to make that all possible? Yes, uh, it is one of the major application indeed, the, the transmission I means optimization of the transmission network we realized that we have been working on development of solar parks around the country uh, we observed that uh, transmission network whatever we developed is poorly utilized then uh, we realized that we we worked on in the in the presentation also i have shown the what is the modality we are doing right now in the ladakh uh, we are planning for 10 gigawatt of uh, re capacities there 
uh, it will be 9 megawatt solar and 4 4 megawatt wind like that 13 uh, sorry uh, gigawatt 13 gigawatt is in in fact it is completely and with that uh, it require initially it was planned with a 10 gigawatt of uh, uh, transmission network two five gigawatt networks actually and you, you see the means laying line from the through the mountains is a very very tedious process and it is very expensive also then we thought of uh, uh, experimenting this at there 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 itself where it really makes sense actually so we can uh, save on a lot of uh, cost of transmission so right now we have our plan is to develop five gigawatt of network uh, it is already being uh, uh, discussed at various uh, levels and the approvals are in process actually for deployment of uh, transmission network we are in the process of finalizing land all these things and the tenders may be released it may be next year okay for the re capacities so transmission networks i think it will be released in this year itself so the work is in the advanced stage there where what we are uh, given is that we designed a 12 gigawatt of uh, energy storage it is not a simple uh, type of energy storage it is like a different c rating uh, energy storage like the c by 4 to 2 c level uh, uh, type of storage uh, different different capacities out of 12 gigawatt we we designed actually to absorb the complete uh, uh, power more than 5 gigawatt we need to absorb that okay that uh, uh, stored energy will be transmitted during the non generation times so with that, uh, our uh, estimation is that uh, we, we are able to load the transmission line more than 70%, uh, depending on the generation, uh, more than 70%. The cost of the transmission also getting reduced by one third, actually, by doing this. So, and Fantastic. This, this, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, go on. Uh, this will be the one of the showcase projects uh, throughout the world, actually, for this uh, application. Okay, so... Brilliant. So so a very strategic targeting of where energy storage can be most effective and most economical, but it's still a very big um, opportunity, I guess. So another question um, for you, Dr. Reddy, on SECI has already been involved in a number of reference projects and investment in, uh, you know, quite a lot of energy storage, including in particular uh, solar plus storage. So can you tell us a little bit about PV plus storage in India and perhaps what sort of lessons can be learned from these demonstration projects and how they help prepare for a bigger rollout of battery storage uh you know either in combination with pv or standalone or in combination with other things like wind perhaps yeah. uh, currently uh, currently we are doing a couple of projects uh, in solar plus storage actually the projects are under uh, uh, execution level now hello yeah we can hear you Ah, so the projects are under execution level okay so the mm -hmm. the main aim of the project one project we are doing in the lay itself lay town okay uh, the, the load of the lay town is around 20 megawatt we are de deploying 50 megawatt solar project there uh, they do a backup of uh, hydro projects also so our uh, aim is to uh, provide uh, 24 by 7 power to lay using this uh, solar plus storage project there uh, but 24 hours is not possible we are giving at least uh, uh, 14 to 16 hours through this uh, project there we did a number of innovations there we are deploying uh, solar capacity in two different orientations and we are deploying 50 megawatt of storage capacities there so we are flattening the generation and also we are uh, uh, storing some of some part of the generation and giving during the evening hours so up to up to 10 o'clock uh, 10 pm or 11 pm we will be able to provide power to the lay especially they are having problems in spite of having couple of hydro projects in winters the water get freezes there they are not getting power so we are addressing that that is the one of the application in chatisgarh they are having the chatisgarh state is having a predominant evening peak uh, demand actually uh, there we analyzed we are de uh, deploying a one cap one project there solar plus storage projects to provide uh, at least three hours of evening peak power during the uh, using storage these two are the project we are doing parallelly seki is normally what we do is that we when we develop some concept we parallelly develop the scheme also uh, based on the, for the ipps actually we in 2019 itself we released a tender for the peak power uh, supply assured peak power supply 
this has been uh, awarded and uh, the contracts have been signed the projects are uh, it's a 1200 megawatt capacity uh, mostly solar plus storage is around uh, 900 megawatt solar wind plus storage is uh, another 300 megawatt by two companies uh, renew and green co they are doing this the projects are at advanced stage of construction now okay maybe by 2024 the projects will get realized in future uh, such type of projects are there the recent thing what we are doing is that most of the discounts they are already tied up with uh, simple solar and uh, storage uh, solar and wind projects right now uh, what we are working with various discount we are working on the new concept now load following concept because uh, some of the discounts they have very low load net load if you see the net load very low net load during the uh, solar times so right now what we are doing is that we are developing uh, re place storage projects especially they declare the load actually we'll follow we'll design the project as per their requirement of the load curve so that we are working with a couple of states so that will be publishing soon and uh, the tenders will be publishing soon and that new concept also all these are with solar plus storage is the mandatory there okay so Fantastic. Add something? yeah of course yeah sure go ahead you know, I think uh, these uh, peak power tenders by Seki were actually a game changer. And in fact, uh, uh, as IESA, we are uh, very strongly supporting those. Uh, uh, the other approach has been the uh, round the clock tender, where we feel that right now, actually, what the Indian market needs is a peak power tender. And we are very happy that just uh, last week now, Gujarat has also come up with a peak power tender similar to sort of building on the Seki. And that's a key role what Seki has been playing on that. And the other area is on the commercial industrial customers, uh, where also there is a lot of, I think, opportunity available because in India, the commercial industrial customers end up paying the highest tariff. Uh, so solar plus storage is actually becoming cost effective for many of these commercial industrial customers already. And the only issue there has been more of a financing. So IESA has been working with World Bank as well as uh, uh, IFC uh, for looking at creating financing tools for uh, enabling faster deployment of uh, uh, these commercial and industrial projects. And we are hoping that in next six months, uh, there may be a 500 million to billion dollar fund which will get set up between World Bank and IFC for supporting these uh, large scale commercial industrial deployments, similar to what World Bank did with State Bank of India for supporting rooftop solar. Uh, so we have already done a lot of groundwork on uh, creating a pipeline for such projects. Wow, okay, okay. All right, so what we're gonna do now is I think we're gonna skip to the audience questions because we've, um, you know, so much to talk about. We've run a little bit over time, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think one of the popular questions is something you literally just alluded to, Rahul, but I think maybe if we can get some some more colour on that from, you know, and if the other panellists want to answer, but what do you see as the overall, sorry, this is a question from audience member uh, Vivek Singh, um, who asks, what would be the overall opportunity for commercial and industrial market, uh, which uh, they've defined as, you know, somewhere between 20 kilowatt and to a megawatt, really? Uh, battery storage systems. Anyone like to start off on a quick reply for that? Yeah, so I think that the range which is picked up is very specific. So again, probably I'll have to go back to the our data to try to narrow down in that number. But if you see just as the overall range for five megawatt or lower, uh, because that's a typical requirement we are seeing with CNI and behind the meter segment, uh, uh, that market based on our market forecast is almost 70 to 75 percent of the total market projections in India. Uh, so uh, uh, it's a very, very large market. And uh, except for maybe residential customers who typically are maybe sort of a two to five kilowatt hour, most of the other, I think, commercial industrial customers would fall under that above 20 kilowatt hour range, uh, uh, but they may go uh, above one megawatt. Okay, anyone else got a quick view on that or? I guess it's a little bit outside of what you guys have been looking at. So there's another question here from uh, Federica Tomasini, um, who asks um, if you have any insights on when uh, you believe the operating procedure of the new ancillary services regulation will be published. Um, but I think also, you know, a general question that I'd be interested to know is in what are sort of the other issues that need to be kind of figured out before uh, you think India will be ready to have a rollout of ancillary service markets uh, that battery storage can participate in? Um, 
Rachel, do you want to maybe just have a, a quick view on what you think in terms of market design and then we'll see if anyone else has got a view or? Yeah, I think like uh, in terms of market design, like what needs to be very precisely uh, explained is like the pre-qualification rules that will be applied to energy storage and knowing exactly what size of energy storage is needed to provide the service uh, to make sure that the energy storage is able to provide the service properly and that um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very clear what uh, the developer must install to provide a certain type of service. Sure, Rahul, I know you were a bit involved in the, you know, the early, well, so a lot of the ongoing work with Ansari services, but what's your view on that? So I, we think that it will be another few months before I think the final guidelines come out because uh, there is actually, in fact, the IESA, we are actually requesting certain changes in the way CERC has proposed it. Uh, we are very happy that already CA has taken our recommendations into account and CA has also actually uh, uh, in a draft uh, uh, Indian Electric Grid Code, which is getting finalized right now for 2022, uh, even the primary reserves have been included and uh, energy storage is now allowed for that. So uh, although the CERC guidelines didn't talk about the primary reserves, uh, I think the CEA new uh, Indian Electric Grid Code is uh, covering that aspect. Uh, but the biggest problem what we have is that right now there is no very there is no advantage for the fast response. I think the timelines which are being talked about for frequency regulation or related services almost goes back to the 1990s timelines what thermal generators were following. And that's a part where actually we are not very happy with the current CRC guidelines, although technically or they allow storage to participate, but we don't think that the way current uh, uh, regulations are getting written will actually create a, a good uh, monetization pathway for energy storage. So uh, we are uh, trying to approach back CRC to get those amendments in that. So that may delay the final thing slightly. Okay. Okay. Now we had a few questions and we're going to have to wrap up shortly, unfortunately. Um, but we had a few questions asking about the different technologies. And I think we're probably assuming that we're talking about lithium ion battery storage uh, for a, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the market, but we did also mention pumped hydro and, you know, there are other technologies sort of emerging, uh, whether non-lithium battery or even non-battery energy storage. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, for example, Dr. Reddy, if you're looking at things like design of the tenders. Um, at the moment, is it mainly lithium ion battery storage you're looking at and what sort of um, levels do you think other technologies will uh, might play a, a role with, do you think? Yeah, uh, you were correctly uh, said that in some of the uh, tenders by CK, CK1 projects or solar plus storage projects, it is uh, specified as battery storage but uh, uh, in scheme projects we have not specified any uh, type of it is energy storage only this pilot project is only it is for intended for battery storage the thousand megawatt it is for battery storage but in future uh, uh, the tenders it will be technology agnostic any any anything will come and even at seki also we are also planning to set up some uh, uh, demonstration facility for uh, upcoming technologies actually as a part of our r and initiatives soon we'll be publishing that okay any any means new technologies can come and demonstrate it's not in megawatt scale maybe sub megawatt scale uh, we can they can demonstrate the pilots that initiative we are taking up here okay so we'll we, we will be most of the times we'll be on the technology agnostic if unless uh, it is specified in some cases Thanks very much, Dr. Reddy. Okay, I think we're going to more or less have to leave it there um, for the session today. Um, really appreciate everyone joining in. And I saw, as I saw lots and lots of questions, you can follow up um, and Clean Horizon will be delighted to speak with you. Um, you can email Rachel uh, directly, rl at cleanhorizon.com or you can get in touch with Clean Horizon at contact at cleanhorizon.com, as you can see on your screen there. Um, the IESA um, Vision 2030 document is available on the India uh, Energy Storage Alliance uh, website. Um, and yeah, I'm sure that all the questions that you 
asked will be followed up online um, by the uh, by the panelists and by Clean Horizon, uh, hopefully fairly shortly. So with that, um, I'd just like to say thank you so much to our panelists um, for taking part. Um, thank you so much to you, the audience. Um, and of course, for everyone out there who's working really hard, whether it's advocating or actually deploying, designing technologies, um, you know, really making this energy transition happen that, you know, I don't need to tell you guys how important it is. Uh, obviously, I'm sure you all know, but there's a lot of uh, a lot of the world that doesn't as well. So I thank you so much for keeping up all your good work. And I really hope to see that continue, pick up pace and accelerate. So once again, thank you so much from me, everyone at Energy Storage News, from Clean Horizon and, uh, and our panelists today. Thank you so much. Thank you.